It's one thing to listen to doom and gloom about food and fertilizer shortages, skyrocketing prices, the cost of living, or your job being outsourced overseas or eliminated due to automation. It's quite another thing to hear practical, immediately actionable advice from experts who can help you reduce the fear, anxiety, and burden of these problems. Tune in now to the Surviving Hard Times podcast from the Finding Genius Foundation with Richard Jacobs. Before we begin, a note from our sponsor. I'm Richard Jacobs, Executive Director of the nonprofit Finding Genius Foundation and host of the Finding Genius podcast. In late 2016, I was rear-ended at 65 miles an hour by a truck on the highway, which sent me off-road into a ditch. The impact of the collision gave me a concussion and other injuries. At the hospital, a CT scan showed that I had thyroid nodules, which turned out to be cancer. It was then, when I had a biopsy in my neck, that I realized, even if I was a millionaire, I wouldn't want a second or a third biopsy due to the pain and the invasiveness of it. And appointments at that time for thyroid experts were three to six months out. And I was worried about dying now, even if that was irrational. So because of this, I've decided to raise money to conduct a literature review on steroids, on the causes of anxiety and depression, a condition that affects well over 50 million people in the United States and hundreds of millions worldwide. Our goal is to create a codex, a guide that reveals all possible treatments for anxiety and depression for people that live with the condition or for loved ones that have it, as my wife and my son do. To find out more about our fundraiser, visit FindingGeniusFoundation.org and click on Current Initiatives. And now, to our guest. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Surviving Hard Times podcast, sponsored by the Finding Genius Foundation. My guest today is Al Pacheco Kovaleski. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Horticulture at University of Wisconsin-Madison. And we're going to talk about uh, dormancy in plants and cold hardiness, you know, in the off-season in the winter. So, Al, thank you for coming. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, tell me a bit about your background and what got you interested in, um, you know, in horticulture and then especially, you know, we'll talk about your research after that. So, what's a bit about your background? Yeah, so I, the horticulture part of things really, or agriculture related things, I come from two families of farmers in the background, but also I remember there was a time when I was, when I was a kid that I did a lot of gardening with my grandma. And so that really, it made me really interested in, in working and studying plants. And so that led me to doing my undergrad that was in ag engineering in Brazil. I was still in Brazil. And then during, during that time, I I worked on a, I I worked at a, as a research assistant um, for a citrus breeding program. And so I was, I was doing some research as an undergrad. And then at some point I got the, there was a study abroad program between my university and university of Florida that got me to US and then turned there working on the blueberry program, it, which ultimately led me to coming back for coming back to the US for my master's working with blueberries. I was working with pruning of blueberries. So it was very, very applied in terms of a project, uh, a little bit different than what I'm doing now. And so from then on, I, I went on to pursue my PhD working with grapevines and then applying the knowledge that I, that the things that we came across in grapevine to other species. So now I have expanded my horizons to from working on just grapevines now i do any any woody perennials so essentially any plants that you see outside in the winter that has some structure left behind that's what i study all right so you know what happens in the winter to plants i mean do they what some plants seem to make it through the winter or they go into i guess like a dormant state but some would just die or they're frozen yeah so what, yeah. what kind of conditions and what kind of plants can survive and why and why not when you think about it, you, we're thinking about different strategies of going through the winter, right? Some of them, especially as we're thinking about annual plants, they are not themselves surviving, but they're producing seeds and their progeny grow the next season. So that would be a strategy of of surviving the winter in the form of seeds. And we can also think about bulbs as they're losing that structure that's exposed to the very cold temperatures outside and they're only keeping the bulb that's underground, which is much, much warmer than the temperatures that, than the air temperatures that we experience in the winter. Um, yeah, it's, 
particularly in higher latitudes, especially here when we're thinking about Wisconsin and even some other colder places as, as we go further north. But the when we think about it, it, it's very clear when things happen during the spring in terms of plants being damaged, right? We, we have a frost in the spring, we'll see tissues dying, and then it's very clear that the plants are not cold hardy. They can't survive those below freezing temperatures. If the tissues freeze, then they are killed or damaged in a significant way. But that also, during the winter, those tissues are there and they're alive. And so that's what that's what they're going through the winter, right? They're trying to keep tissues that are alive in a certain way. And they have to hold them in that manner until growth resumes in the spring. Um, so this is this is what plants are going through during that time. Well, again, what determines whether a plant dies versus goes dormant in the winter? Okay, so that's in terms of evolution, right? So these, the, when, when we're thinking about that, this is something that was predefined, I guess, a, a long time ago for, especially in terms of the species that we're working with, whether they would become annual plants or perennial plants. So it really is whether they stay out is how much they are investing in the structures that they have and how beneficial that is for the environment that they thrive in. And so when we're thinking about perennial plants, we're times we're thinking about forests. And so they are investing a lot in that wood so that they, the plants can grow tall and intercept sun so that they can continue growing in, in the community that they're inserted in. So there's a well, little like, bit of it. Yeah, like sorry. I'm here, I'm here in Texas and you know, the, the state or the city planted some stuff on the side of the highway, I guess, to make it look nice. Some of it was cactus. Some of it was various grasses and ferns and the cactus are all dead and the other ones are not, but but we had a freeze. So what, why did some die and some not? Oh, okay. Well then over there, you're thinking about something that's possibly what they were planting. They were, they were thinking about something that's presumably fringe for the, for the location. And if you're thinking about specifically now, what's been happening lately we're really seeing things that are more related to climate change with the polar air escaping and going much further south than usually it would go um, because of this looser uh, uh, jet stream that we have and then the polar vortex can flow further south. Um, and, and so that's that's what's happening. You're planting things that were adapted to the conditions, maybe that were adapted to the conditions that were there before, but they're not anymore. Now, when you're thinking about what is alive and what is not, um, when you're thinking grasses specifically, a lot of them actually, they, they'll uh, they'll survive as the, the stolons and some of them have rhizomes, which are very close to the ground or underground structures and so they're they're making use of that of that warmer temperature that the ground has in in relation to the air um when you're thinking about more northern latitudes sometimes those species will rely on actually having snow on top of them to help buffer a little bit of the coldest uh, temperatures in the winter and so that's what they they some of the grasses might look very dead but they do still have living structures in in them which are meristematic tissues which will generate the the plant that will grow in the spring when the when the warm temperatures resume so th these meristems are essentially what we meristematic cells are what we know of, what we are more familiar with is stem cells in humans this is the in humans and animals Meristematic cells are the stem cells in, in plants that can generate any tissue. And so those are the, the cells that the plants are trying to keep alive so that they can continue growing in the following season. Uh, so that's, that's how it works. So presumably, the structures that, that are there, they look dead, similar to a tree losing its leaves in the fall. The leaves are dead, but the, the, there's structures that are being left behind that are still alive. But like for the cactus, maybe they have uh, a much higher water content in their tissues. And when we had the freeze, maybe all that water literally froze and killed it from yeah. the inside. Maybe drier yeah. plants are not susceptible because of that. Yeah. And I actually don't know a lot about cacti. I know that there's like 
there's a number of them that are adapted to to very low temperatures. So it might have been in terms of like, when were these plants actually planted in that location? Did they actually have time to acclimate? Because this is that's an important portion of, of this whole process. Uh, the plants are, as I was saying, in the spring, the plants can be damaged. In the fall, you also have the same thing. The plants have to acquire cold hardiness before they experience the low temperatures. So if they don't have the, if they're not trained for the cold, the temperatures that they'll experience, they, they might uh, suffer damage. So that could have been what what occurred to those uh, to the cacti that you're that you're thinking about. What do you think of my armchair scientist uh, water hypothesis theory? Uh, it, it might be a very good one. So there's we actually do we try to measure water content of the of the material that we work with. There's some there's definitely correlations between water content and the cold hardiness. Uh, I work most particularly with buds. And this is the, whenever the plants are killed, it's definitely related to ice forming. And it, it depends on where the ice is forming in the plant, whether the plant survives or not. Um, and, and so having higher water content, you're, you always have higher likelihood of ice forming. There's like a part of the the physics behind ice that relies on probability of ice forming. Um, it, it's a very interesting aspect of the of freezing, I guess, that goes much beyond just plants. Uh, it applies to other sciences as well. Well, what if I was a, a farmer of, I don't know which kind of crop, but you know, I went around with a, um, like a fire extinguisher type device and I and you know temporarily like exposed my plants to extreme cold would that do anything to make them more hardy for the winter or let's say it occurs naturally you know um we start winter and like here in texas this year we had an unusual cold snap very early on you know went down to like 25 for a couple days and now it's really warm again um does that help plants or does that stress them in a bad way like what can people do to make their plants more hardy so that Maybe they can get a little bit of season extension or, again, a, a more resiliency to cold. Yeah. So that actually, that's, that's a very great question. Um, it's, so the plants, they have um, um, anthropomorphizing plants now, but like they have adapted to, to, they have some knowledge of where they are in the winter. And so they have this switch in a mechanism where uh, you were talking about cold early on and then warming up in the middle of the winter. They, they have this thing where the, the acclimation or gaining cold hardiness is preferred or happens much better in the early, in the fall and early winter. So the plants will respond more in gaining cold hardiness than losing cold hardiness early in the winter. Um, so that, that, that is something that happens. Um, and then as they have been experiencing low temperatures during the winter, they start shifting this response into preferring the, the deacclimation or the loss of cold hardiness. Uh, and so th this is something that we're seeing now in terms of doing experiments that the same temperatures can lead you to different responses depending on when, when the on when you're studying this. And so low but above freezing temperatures can lead to them gaining cold hardiness in the early in the early winter. But late in the winter and in the spring, those same temperatures might lead them to lose that that cold hardiness that they gained. So that, that that's one part of the of your question answering one part. The the other part of what you asked is like, what can we do to help these plants? It turns out that actually studying acclimation is very complicated. It, it seems like a very complicated process. We, we keep trying to repeat results in controlled environment, and it and it's very difficult. And so because of that, I feel like our knowledge is a little bit limited in, the, in that way. But there are so in, in terms of what you were saying with the fire extinguisher, getting that like slightly lower temperature to them. A single exposure does very little to the plants. Uh, they require, uh, it seems like about two weeks to actually start responding well and actually gaining some cold hardiness from experiencing low temperatures. But there are 
some people working with different products that appear to make them gain cold hardiness a little bit earlier. And so one of those would be there's this hormone that's called abscisic acid. And there's commercial products which are abscisic acid that you can try to apply to the plants. And it does seem like they do respond to that and they gain a little bit more of cold hardiness with those products. So we're working on alternatives. That's like a current area of research, finding alternatives to provide more cold hardiness to plants if they are going to experience these events as the ones you're talking about with the freezes. Okay. So one time exposure to cold, like a, I don't know, one really, really cold night in whatever area is not enough. It seems to take, like you said, prolonged cold for them to shift into a new regime and protect themselves. Yeah. Uh, and it, it's either those like continuously low temperatures. The other part that we've seen that is important is daily amplitude in temperature. So having temperature variation within a day appears to be important in terms of signaling the plants to gain cold hardiness. So a combination of those two things is is important for them. Well, you know, I'm imagining plants, again, sitting out in the field or in a greenhouse or whatever it may be. And, you know, as the season changes, the first thing it seems to be at night you know, they're going to get colder than they used to be. So for, I don't know, let's say eight, eight, 10, 12 hours at night, they're going to experience it becoming colder and colder. And maybe that's what gently and persistently acclimates them to the new season that's coming. Same thing with, you know, spring and summer and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. So like, as as those temperatures start occurring outside, that's what we've seen. And that's what we've been using to to model the cold hardiness, because part of the work that I do is in terms of modeling how, how the plants are gaining cold hardiness. And so what we understand is that these as these lower temperatures start occurring, that will lead to, to the gains in cold hardiness. Has anyone um, looked at the coincidence of light and temperature? So, you know, again, like um, plants as they're nearing whatever season it may be, they're receiving this new, you know, high or low temperature signal in the absence of light. Has anyone tested it where they are keeping the plants under light, let's say, you know, well into the evening, but the temperature is dropping. Like, uh, you know, does the signal signaling change in the absence of light or the presence of light? Yes, absolutely. There, there are people that do a lot of research in terms of, and in here, we, we have to separate light effects. There's like essentially three things that we can think of. Light in terms of energy there is just like been some recent publications and showing how like we might need to acknowledge when the sun is shining outside the actual temperature that the plants that the buds are experiencing is warmer depending on their color because they're absorbing that energy and increase their internal temperature so that is, that is one but that's not really what you're asking here is about the two other parts of thinking about light which are, um, you're thinking about the length of the day, uh, which is something that the plants perceive. And the other is the light quality. What is the wavelength of light that's actually coming through to the plant? There are a lot of people that work with these aspects. They have personally not actually done any research with involving a lot of light, just a little bit in terms of day length. Yeah, the reason uh, I ask is like maybe a strategy would be on a small test field is to have t- lights with timers so that when it gets cold, instead of letting them hang out in the cold darkness, maybe the lights come on, you know, certain wavelengths or even full spectrum, you know, at various times during the night. I know it would affect them in other ways, but maybe that would change how they adapt to the cold. It might make it better or worse. I don't know. It might be an experiment. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that's why, so just if you think about that, we can think about why it is that I chose in most of my research to ignore the effects of lights. Because when you think about plants that are in, in urban locations where they are exposed to lights and they still survive the winter, right? So it's not which would indicate that the largest response actually comes from the temperatures that the plants are experiencing. I'm saying this, but I am aware of research, particularly with evergreen plants, where they do, they are very affected by, by light, lighting conditions. Seems to be a very strong cue, particularly for very northern, for very high latitude locations. Thinking 
about research that comes out of Norway, working with Norway spruce, where they do see like these effects of light in terms of making plants going dormant and keeping them dormant or like letting them be released from their dormancy. Okay. I mean, so you don't deal much with light or you are dealing with it, like you said, only in a very specific way. I uh, working much more with the with the temperature effects than the light effect. The way we treat light is just looking at a little bit in terms of short and long day lengths, but not in a very, not in a, we're really looking for the responses from the temperatures more than we are looking at day length per se. All right. So what are you noticing in your temperature matrix? Like what, what behaviors are you able to encourage or discourage? So I've been saying a little bit about the temperature fluctuations being important is that when you're thinking about low temperatures, but that are above freezing, they actually don't help the plants acclimate. If you're just keeping them constant throughout the entire day, you really need some fluctuation when you're looking at above freezing temperatures. However, when you go to below freezing temperatures, then you start actually having acclimation, even if even if you don't have fluctuation of temperatures. That is one thing. However, they so this is when we're thinking about cold hardiness, but there's also the the other part that is somewhat separate from this that is the dormancy. And so in terms of dormancy, those constant temperatures do help the plants overcome their dormancy as the winter is progressing. What does that mean they overcome their dormancy as the winter progresses? So like uh, we've been talking about plants in general, but I, I just want to bring it back that my expertise is in woody perennials. So here we're talking about trees. Okay. And so the trees, they have to know when they are going to start growing again in the spring, right? They, they Because as you were saying here, the plants might be experiencing some warm temperatures in the middle of the winter. And they have to know that not actually spring yet when those temperatures come to be. And so they, they to do so, have evolved to have this clock where they the clock only runs when they are being exposed to these low winter temperatures. And they need to count a number of hours at those low temperatures before they become responsive to warm temperatures. So very early in the winter, if you have warm temperatures, the plants will not resume growth. And so this is what the dormancy is. And so later on, once they have been exposed to enough time in these low temperatures, then they will have overcome their dormancy and then they can resume growth in the spring. So that's what the, the overcoming dormancy means. Okay, so the woody perennials you're talking about are these like uh, like fruit trees typically that'll be in orchards, or you mentioned grapes earlier. Yeah, you know, what, what yeah are you absolutely. Focus, what plants are you focused on? So these are when you're thinking about fruit trees, uh, woody perennials, the grape vines, essentially anything that you see out of the ground that has woody structures that survive over the years, those would be woody woody perennials. So anything that keeps things alive during the winter, you could think of that. I A lot of the work that I do at this moment actually is with trees and forests, some ornamentals as well. So that's what I'm thinking about in terms of woody perennials. So what, what advice would you have for people that, you know, maybe just hobbyists are growing, you know, woody perennials or other plants and just, you know, it's, they're headed towards the fall. What can they do to make sure that their, uh, their plants don't die in the winter? Anything that you've figured out yet? So the first thing that they, they'll have to do is actually having things that are adapted to wherever they're they're from, right? Where they're planting these things. There's a, a number, there's a number of plants that are not as when we're thinking, for example, just thinking about grapevines. When we think about vinifera grapevines, they are not very adapted to cold, very cold old environment. So for example, here in Wisconsin, we don't have vinifera grapevines. We only grow hybrids in, in this area. So Having the plants that are adapted to the region where you're from, that's the only thing essentially that we can do at this moment when we're trying to guarantee survival. And then the question that might stem from that is that, well, what if I just plant things that are from very cold environments in a warm environment? So, for example, if we were planting boreal species in Texas where, where you're 
where you're calling from. They would not fare well because those boreal plants, they need to spend a lot of time in winter before they can resume growth in the spring. They have to have that chilling clock run a lot longer than some other plants that are adapted to your location. So in that case, they just wouldn't resume growth very well down there. So that's that's the balance that you have to go with. You have to have something that's cold hardy enough to your location and then have something that will resume growth well in the spring. Um, so those are those are the things. So at this moment, it's more in terms of a cultivar or a, a species selection, especially when you're thinking about small kale growers or home growers. We can talk about alternatives then for when you're thinking about larger scale. Commercial growers do end up, there's one specific product that can be used to overcome dormancy, uh, and that is used um, in fruit crops so that the plants can resume growth in the spring, even if they haven't experienced enough of that chilling, enough of that cold in the in the winter. Uh, there's a product that can be applied, and that's called hydrogen cyanamide. It's something that we often try to incorporate in our research to try to figure out what what that is actually doing to make plants resume their growth. But what does it do? What does this chemical do to the plants? How does it affect them? We don't know. It's this very interesting thing where we know that plants respond very well to it we don't know why exactly they're doing it and part of it is because we don't know molecularly we don't understand dormancy very well so we don't know what those mechanisms are we don't know how the plants are counting that that low temperature exposure and, and so because of that we don't understand how hydrogen cyanamide is working we know that it worked. And so that's why we continue using it and haven't found an alternative yet. Okay. Well, very good. Uh, Al, what's the best place for people to learn more about your work? Where can they go? They can go on to the website for my for my lab. It's plantresilience.cals.wis.edu. And in there, there's actually an outreach tab where there's a text where they can read about all of these aspects and in like a friendly way, in a low stakes way that could be very interesting for someone who is not an expert in plants. Okay, very good. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and imparting your knowledge. I know it's an area that doesn't have a lot of firm data yet, but very interesting and very important. So thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Rich. Before you stop listening, ask yourself, what are one or two useful things you heard on this podcast that can help you overcome food and fertilizer shortages, skyrocketing prices, the cost of living, or your job being outsourced overseas or eliminated due to automation. Please like and subscribe and tell your friends and family about their Surviving Hard Times podcast. We're all going to need help now and in the near future.